Hi guys, this is Mrs. McQuaid, and today we're going to talk about unifying themes that connect concepts from many different fields of biology. If you'd like to print out a copy of the slides to take notes on, visit my website at www.7gablescience.com. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the video comments, and I'll respond as soon as I can. So the only real objective here is to look at four major unifying themes in biology and some of the big ideas that make them up. Vocab should look familiar, at least some of it, from last section. So you're going to see the words homeostasis, DNA, metabolism, evolution, universal genetic code, heredity, and adaptation. In addition to that, we're going to look at something called negative feedback, positive feedback, dynamic, natural selection, and chromosome. So the study of biology revolves around several interlocking big ideas. These include the cellular basis of life, information and heredity, matter and energy, growth, development, and reproduction, homeostasis, evolution, structure and function, unity and diversity of life, interdependence in nature, and science as a way of knowing. We're going to kind of combine these things into four unifying themes. The first unifying theme we'll look at is the process of evolution drives the diversity and unity of life. The second is that biological systems utilize energy and molecular building blocks to grow, reproduce, and maintain dynamic homeostasis. The third is living systems store, retrieve, transmit, and respond to information essential to life processes. And the last one is that biological systems interact and these systems and their interactions possess complex properties. So we'll start with the first big idea, which is that evolution explains the unity and diversity of life. Evolution is defined as a change in populations of living things over many generations. The genetic makeup of the population of a species actually changes when it evolves. Here's an example of how it could work. In this picture number one, you see that we've got some mice, gray and white. You can also see that the environment they're in makes it so that the gray mice blend in pretty well, but those white mice stand out. In picture number two, you can see what we have happening is something called natural selection. This is where something in the environment exerts pressure on the population. In this example, it's a predator. You can see here that the bird has picked up a mouse and it's picked up the white mouse. It's not because white mice taste better, it's just because they're easier to see, so they're easier to catch. Now, over time, in picture three, if more and more white mice are eaten, that's gonna leave fewer of them behind to reproduce. And if they don't reproduce, they don't pass their genes for white fur onto the next generation. In other words, subsequent generations become darker and darker because there's an advantage to being darker. You blend in with the environment and avoid predation. So in this case, the adaptation that helps the mice survive is the darker colored fur. Adaptations are defined as beneficial inherited traits that are passed to future generations through DNA. And over time, through the process of natural selection, you can see some pretty interesting adaptations evolve. For example, we have on the right an insect that has evolved to look like a plant, more specifically like a thorn, and obviously that's going to help him avoid being eaten by predators. And on the left, you can see a plant that actually has evolved to look like a specific kind of insect, and that actually helps that plant get pollinated. So when we talk about adaptations, they um, include not just physical traits, but also behaviors. Anything that helps the organism survive in its environment and that gets passed on from one generation to the next. 
we have a picture of a polar bear here, and you can see that there's a close-up photo of one of their hairs, and something you should notice is that those hairs are hollow. Now, probably you know that polar bears live in cold places, like the poles, and it's really cold. So having that hollow space in their fur actually allows it to trap heat Kind of like if you think about your car in the summertime when you have all the windows rolled up and it's parked out in the sun and it's really hot out. When you open that car door, it's really hot inside. And that's because when the air gets trapped inside the car, it heats up and the heat gets stuck inside. And the same thing happens with each of the hairs on the polar bear. It can trap the heat from the body of the polar bear in that space and it helps the polar bear stay warm even in the frigid polar temperatures. Our second big idea is that biological systems utilize free energy and molecular building blocks to grow, reproduce, and maintain dynamic homeostasis. There's a lot to unpack here. So let's start by looking at just the first two words, biological systems. A system is any organized group of interacting parts. So in biology, we can look at cells as systems because they're composed of complex chemicals and processes that have to interact to keep the cell alive. We can look at body systems like the nervous system or the respiratory system or the cardiovascular system that include organs that have to interact to perform that function. And we can look at ecosystems, which include both living and non-living parts of an environment. In all of these cases, we've got interacting pieces that form complex interactions. So as we move on to the next part of this big idea, it says it utilizes free energy and molecular building blocks to grow and reproduce. So we talked in the last section about how organisms require energy if you're an animal in the form of food. If you're a plant, they need sunlight. And either way, you're gonna be taking things from the environment. So in photosynthesis, plants use the light energy to catalyze a chemical reaction between carbon dioxide and water that turns those items or molecules into glucose, sugar, and oxygen. And those are part of a cycle that occurs in the ecosystem that we are familiar with as like a food chain, right? So then an animal like this little rabbit could eat the plant to get the sugar and obviously they breathe and they take in the oxygen and through another set of chemical reactions called cellular respiration, they're gonna use that energy to generate ATP. Again, the most important molecule of energy for all living things is ATP. Um, and then they will exhale carbon dioxide and release water back into the environment, and that cycle can repeat over and over again. So different organisms can employ different strategies to capture and use energy, but all organisms have some strategies to capture and use energy. And that energy is often used to maintain dynamic homeostasis. Homeostasis, if you remember, is maintaining those internal conditions necessary for life. And homeostasis is usually maintained through what we call that, uh, feedback mechanisms. So there are positive feedback mechanisms and negative feedback mechanisms. In positive feedback loops, we can amplify a response. A good example of this is when a woman goes into labor, she releases a hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin causes the uterus to contract to obviously push the baby out. But every time the uterus contracts, it causes her body to release more oxytocin. And so contractions get stronger and stronger until eventually they're strong enough to deliver the baby. Negative feedback loops are what usually we use to maintain homeostasis, and there's a lot of different kinds of negative feedback loops. One example that you're probably familiar with is your body temperature. So we know that our internal temperature has to be 98.6 degrees, and if it's too hot or too cold, then we become uncomfortable. So for example, if you get cold, 
then your skin is going to um, identify that you're cold through receptors. It's going to send a message to your brain, specifically the hypothalamus, because that's the part of the brain that controls your body temperature. And your hypothalamus is going to do things to either make you shiver if you're cold, to try and warm you up, or if you're hot, it can open your sweat glands so that you start sweating and increase uh, blood vessel dilation, which will help to cool you off, just depending on which way you need to go. So in a negative feedback loop, it's where the stimulus causes a response that turns off or changes the stimulus. It kind of keeps you at that set point. Our third big idea is that living systems store, retrieve, transmit, and respond to in information essential to life processes. Now, there are several different ways that this happens. Obviously, our nervous system is responsible for um, is responding to the environment and sensing the environment. But even at the cell level, we have our genetic information, which is so important for the continuity in life. So our genes or DNA is passed from parents to offspring, and it contains all of that instructions and that heritable information packaged into chromosomes. Those chromosomes have the instructions necessary for survival and growth and reproduction. And we know from an evolutionary standpoint that genetic variation is almost always advantageous for long-term survival of the species. So we'll look more at that later. Our last big idea is that biological systems interact and these complex interactions um, create really complex properties. So remember that all biological systems are composed of interacting parts, and those interactions result in characteristics that are not found in the individual parts alone. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And biologists can study lots of different interacting systems from cells to ecosystems. Um, what we have in the picture here is an interaction that people were quite frankly surprised about. This little um, shrimp has crawled into the mouth of an eel and you could see he's got pretty sharp teeth and he's a predator and you would think that that eel would eat the shrimp but they actually have formed a relationship where the shrimp picks the crud out of the eel's teeth thereby acting as his dentist which is good for an eel who can't just go see a dentist if he gets a cavity or a toothache um, and the eel doesn't eat him. So they both benefit from this. And it's a really cool example of how we can see these complex properties of these interacting parts of systems. Thanks for watching. For more resources, including printable notes, worksheets, and links to online practice, visit my website at www.sevengablescience.com and like and subscribe to my YouTube channel, Seven Gable Science, to keep learning.